In Robocraft 2, players have a lot of freedom when it comes to how they put the robot together. This means that players can innovate, they can create their own thing, and sometimes a player comes up with an idea that is really really good and really really effective, and sometimes that player is not you. And every time you run into that build in a multiplayer match, it's trouble. You don't manage to deal with it. And regardless of the approach you take, they get the better of you. Again. And again. And again. And again. And that can be very frustrating. But frustration can sometimes lead to innovation. Sometimes, not this time. This time, it led to stealing. So what is the difference between copying and stealing? If you copy, you recreate something someone else built, part by part, not really understanding why it works the way it does, you just make the exact same thing. While stealing is about understanding how it works, so you can take it and incorporate it into your own builds and make your own thing. So this video is a tutorial about how to make a pincer melee bot. I won't just show you step by step how to put stuff together, I will try to explain along the way how melee damage work, what you have to think about and be aware of, as well as explaining every step of the logic for the pincher melee weapons so that you will be able to modify it and tweak it to your liking if you want them to behave a little bit different. With that, let's get going. So let's start by talking about melee damage in Robocraft 2. Not just about how pincers work, but like melee damage in general. Here is how it works. I'm just kidding, you don't need to know all that. The thing you need to know is that the greater the mass and the greater the velocity, the more damage you will do to the opponent. So what we are using in Robocraft 2 in order to create melee weapons are different power joints. These can be used to turn parts of your robot to swing towards an enemy robot and thus create a melee weapon. They have a max speed and obviously we want max speed for max damage. And the way we can increase the speed of that impact is by making longer arms. Because if they turn here at a certain velocity, the further out we go, the faster it will travel. The second thing you need to know is that mass is important, and it's more important than speed. Even if the speed you're hitting an opponent with is rather low, if your mass is a lot higher than that of the opponent's, you will still do a great deal of damage. This also means that you cannot really punch above your weight class. If you would try to use a melee weapon or ram someone that is a lot heavier than you, you would just damage yourself, not them. So if the melee weapon gets more effective and does more damage the heavier you are, why not make the heaviest possible robot? Well that's simple, because the heavier you are, the slower you will go, and the harder it will be to actually get close enough to enemies and catch up to them to use your melee weapon. But the lighter you are and the faster you are, the fewer robots the melee weapon will actually work effectively on. So you can't just go as heavy as possible, you kind of have to find the right balance where you're still fast enough to catch up to some robots, but also heavy enough to deal damage to a fair number of opponents. How heavy that is will probably change a lot over time, because it depends largely on the type of robots your opponents are using, and that will change as the game develops. A third thing that is important to know about collision damage is that if it's possible for a robot to kind of get pushed towards the side or pushed backwards, they will actually take less damage than if they have nowhere to escape. And that's why the most effective melee weapons in Robocraft 2 are kind of two parts. You, you clap the opponent, you crush them in big jaws, you pinch them, but somehow you want them to end up between two forces that are pushing from either side. And that is one of the reasons why pincers are really good, the opponents will have nowhere to escape, it will be crushed between the jewels like this and you will do substantial damage. The second reason why it's really good is that the joints that are the weak spots are really easy to protect. 
When the arms are folded in like this, this joint is really well protected by a lot of layers of armor. The other joint for each arm here in the back is not as well protected, but that means that as long as you manage to keep the front towards the enemy, they are left with a really hard choice. They can try to disable your melee weapons, but that will take a lot of time, so in that time you can do substantial damage to them with your guns. Or they can go for your guns, but then of course they will have to worry about your melee weapons and you get them close to them. The obvious counter to this is of course everything that flies, but also really fast and agile ground bots that can just stay out of reach, keep shooting at you and pretty much ignoring that the fact that you got melee weapons. So now let's get into the specifics on how it is set up. So what we are using here is the hinge servo. You can scale it up by holding shift and scrolling the middle mouse button like this. And I use the biggest size on this one. It's set up in a way where it can turn in either direction here. Uh, so left or right and same goes for this one. You obviously want like good connection point for the joints for the arms and the good armor for the arms because otherwise they will be shot off too easily by opponents. But I won't really go into that too much because it's better left I feel for like an armor video how to do like good joints connection and how to make a good armor for your robot. Just try to get really long and good connections and use a mix of medium and heavy material in the arms. This is also kind of a good way to tune the weight of your robot. If it's a bit on the heavy side, you can always change a few of the heavy cubes in the arms for, for medium. And if it should be heavier, you can change some of the medium ones for heavy. This is actually not optimal armor because if you have heavy plates like this, you kind of want to use those connection points to lift the connection strength of medium cubes or medium material. But I really wanted this pattern on top of the arms. So that's why I used heavy cubes on top anyway, despite it not actually being the best place for them. They should be kind of mixed in in the middle. I made a copy of my robot, I removed all the logic and I reset the hinges to their default state. Now in their default state, Direction is normal, max and mean angle is 90 and speed is 60. So if there's no logic uh, from the like a logic block or from the pilot seat connected to the hinge, it will be in its on state. So the default is on and that will make it move forward. But the forward is not in terms of how your vehicle is facing, it depends on how the hinge is mounted. So if we take this one into test mode, You can see the arms are actually folding in different direction because the left and right hand side hinges have decided that different things is forward. Because we want the arms to fold inwards on a positive signal, uh, that means we have to fix that. And the easy way to fix it is simply by changing the direction of the hinges. If we put here in the reverse, and in reverse it will suddenly consider the other direction being forward. The second thing we want is speed. So we will just max the speed to 500 for all the hinges. Up to 500 here, 500 here, and 500 here. And let's take it back into test mode and check the result out. Now the arms clap together in the right direction with a high speed, but there's no enemy robot there. They will just clash against themselves and because there are no self damage in Robocraft 2, this will actually result in a lot of ghost forces. And the most likely result of this is that the robot will slowly start to break apart itself. Now with the hinges set up in the right direction, let's start working on the logic. I will make kind of a temporary plate here to place the logic on. Later on we will move them to kind of a small plate, but it makes it easier to work with them when you have them kind of spread out. So let's start with the default state first. That would be what, like with the arms folded, uh, the state we want them to be unless we press a key. That would be with these parts folded backwards and these front parts folded inwards. If we want something to happen while we are not doing something and not get this really good, it outputs a 1 if the input is 0 and vice versa. So let's place it here and we take the input to the key we want to use for the melee weapon. I like space for that, so let's click that one. So as long as we are not holding space, it will be a 0 in here and a 1 out here. If we press space, the output will be 0. So let's connect this one to the arms because we want them to have a positive signal and fold inwards unless we press the key. And over here. These parts of the arms we want to fold backwards unless we press the key. We can do that with a side mat block. It will just switch a plus to a minus and a minus to a plus. So the plus one out from the not gate will become a minus one. So let's put it over here and let's connect that input to these hinges. And after that we can try again 
and see what happens when we spawn it into the test zone. Dart will now fold inwards automatically on spawn and if we move forward here a bit, if we press space, they will actually revert outside towards their default position or their zero position. So now let's start to work on the actual strike. We kind of have part of that movement already because as we press the key down these arms are moving forward into their zero position here but we also while they are doing that want these arms to kind of fold outwards to get a bigger strike so we can catch robots that try to pass us on the sides but also get like as much velocity as possible as we strike inwards and as much reach as possible. So when we press the key we want these ones to go to a negative position to start with and the way to do that is again we can use the sign block just take it like this input to the key we want and output directly to these arms like this now if we hold down space they will no longer get the plus value from this one because we're not holding down space but instead get the negative value from this one because we are holding down space we can now see that working as we press the space bar they go out into a strike position like this uh, and they can move inwards again. We can limit a little bit how much they can swing backwards uh, so they will actually have time to swing in and hit our uh, target with these parts of the weapon and not like somewhere over here and we can do that by changing uh, max and mean angle just like with forward and backward. What is the min angle and max angle depends how the hinge was rotated when you placed it. So it's kind of hard to know if it's this angle or that angle here that is the mean angle. The best way to check that is simply by testing it works. So we put this one to 60 and we also put this one to 60 for the max angle and then we take it into test mode and see what happens. We can now see the left side not folding completely, but the right side is doing exactly what we want and like folding out but not all the way. Meaning we just need to go in here and instead of setting max angle for this one, we can put it back to 90 and change mean angle to 60. Like this. Save again. Now let's start with the more complicated part. We prepared the strike. This one have moved forward, these ones outward. Now we want them to move inwards, but we don't want to have like additional keys and have to kind of time keystrokes for this to work. We want it to be automated. And the way we do that is using a timer. So the way the timer block works is that if we connect the start value here to something, in this case, the same key, once we press that one, the timer will start to run for as many seconds we put here. And when it's done running, ended will turn from a zero output to a one output. We could use the ended result here, but uh, I want it to automatically retract after the strike to kind of minimize the risk or the time frame where you get ghost forces. So I will use the progress instead. Now the progress is a percentage output of the progress of time. So at the start of the timer, we would output zero, then 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And the closer we get to finished progress, the closer the progress output will be to one. So what I will do is connect the end to start and reset. That means that at the end of whatever time we end up putting here, everything will reset to zero here. Then I will compare progress to something else. And what we will do is compare the progress to a constant. Let's grab a constant block here and put this one to 0 0.5. Just to get something to start working with, grab a greater than math block. This will output a one if input A is greater than input B, otherwise it will output zero. If we connect it like this, that means that when progress is past 50% of the timer, uh, that is greater than this number, right? This one will output uh, one and be active, and otherwise it will output zero. We could actually connect this one directly to the hinges here and it would work, but I kind of want you to be able to cancel the strikes. I only want this time one to work if you're actually, by the time this happens, still holding the spacebar down. And for that we will use the multiplier block. Now we could have used an AND gate as well in this particular scenario, but the multiplier block don't lose information. Like an AND gate can only output 0 or 1, while the multiplier block can kind of end up outputting whatever, right? Um, but in this case it is a plus 1 we will be outputting anyway, or 0. So if we connect it like this, and then the other part up to the spacebar, what will happen is, uh, if we have let go of the spacebar when the timer has kind of run past 50%, it will be an out one here, 
but it will be zero here. So it will still be zero regardless, right? And let's connect that one to all of our different hinges. Up here. This one, and lastly, this one over here, and take it into test mode. If we hold the spacebar now, you can see it clap like this. You can see it automatically retract again, so we don't get ghost forces for too long, which kind of diminish the risk of us hurting ourselves. We can also cancel mid-strike if we let go of the spacebar kind of midway through. We start to close in towards the finish line now. What is left is pretty much just a bit of tuning. We don't want these ones to fold in all the way anyway, so we can kind of limit these hinges a bit, just like we did with these ones, but in this direction. Um, just like with these ones, we don't really know which one here is mean and max values. So we'll have to kind of see which one is which by just testing. So it turns out it was the max angle on this side that needed to be 50 and not mean angle. And on the other side here, it was the mean angle. But this could be the other way around for you, depending on how you rotated the hinges when you placed them. I also kind of want to make sure the arms get time to retract all the way. So I feel like the one second here is a bit too short. So we'll try with 1.5 instead. Now we can cancel the strike. We can hold it and it will clasp like this. You can see it retract all the way before the clasp actually happens. And we can try it on one of the test subjects down here in the pit. And there we go, target destroyed. And that is all, that's how you make a working pincer robot. All that is left really here is moving these ones to a smaller plate. Hope you liked this guide. Uh, if you did, give a thumbs up, uh, maybe leave a comment in the comment section below, and maybe subscribe if you plan to play some Robocraft 2 and feel like my guys might be of use to you. Uh, now, all that is left is to actually try this thing against other people in a multiplayer game.
take on the lead. Victory!